This is a short mini lecture, half lecture, quarter lecture for LSE 7010, Approaches to the Studies of Values in the MAEPA program at HKBU, first semester of the 2019-2020 academic year. So since we've had uh, our seventh lecture uh, canceled for security and transportation reasons, uh, and since I've got the notes online, I'm just going to go over the material uh, briefly, I may end up adding very little to what's in the notes. This is mainly in hopes that uh, a slightly more conversational approach might might clarify some things for some students that might not be clear just from reading the notes. Although, who knows, I may come up with any number of things that are not in the notes. You've probably noticed that that's how I work. When my brain goes into lecture mode, I think of all sorts of things I might not think of while I'm just typing notes. So the plan for today was to look at some ordinary, even some everyday ethical questions in line of Kant and Mill. Again, we're doing this um, application of moral theory, and we're applying the utilitarian moral theory as exemplified by Mill, and the deontological moral theory as exemplified by Kant. And I must emphasize again, uh, that thing I keep saying, that this is not necessarily too dramatically different or inconsistent theories as to how we should live, so much as two different methods. And I am such an optimist that I even think of them as complementary methods, not necessarily uh, incompatible methods. I think they give the same results far more often than people think. To illustrate with this first question, is lying acceptable or when is lying acceptable? Now the usual simple way of approaching the Kantian perspective on this goes something like this. All you have to do is apply categorical imperative version 1. Version 1 tells us only do that which you could wish would be a universalizable action, meaning imagine that everyone lied when they wanted to. No one would believe anyone, so lying would do you no good, so lying is always wrong. Imagine everyone acts the same way. Imagine a world in which everyone acts the same way. If that world works out and it's a moral action, otherwise it's not. And the simple uh, utilitarian analysis is something like this. The only rule is happiness. Do what makes you happy, as long as you're not hurting anyone. And do what you want to do. This is the uh, in a fairly common, oversimplified way of thinking through deontology versus utilitarianism. I don't think it's uh, entirely appropriate. If we follow the method actually laid out by Kant in the Groundwork for Metaphysics of Morals, or the method actually laid out by Mill in his book Utilitarianism, for answering moral questions, we'll find things look a little more complex. So a more complex Kantian analysis, I think, does very well employ categorical imperative version 1, which means take the justification for your action. Remember, Kant is, when he illustrates categorical imperative version 1, talks about our maxims. And maxim, as far as I can understand Kant, and again, I'm still learning <laughs> Kant myself, understanding these characters is the project of a lifetime. You don't automatically switch from ignorance to full comprehension when you get the PhD. So I myself am still learning to understand and apply the moral theories of the great philosophers. But according to my working understanding, when Kant says maxim, he's talking about the justification for your actions. So, or you could think of it as the reason you're, you're doing the action. If you were to put it into a sentence form, uh, I can do such and such under certain circumstances. So do apply this to categorical imper imperative version 1, or apply categorical imperative version 1 to this. Take that justification for your action and imagine a world. The imagine a world uh, description of categorical imperative version 1 I think works pretty well. Imagine a world in which everyone does the same thing. So um, let's take lying and let's say you're just lying because it's convenient. Uh, let's take a very practical illustration drawn from in the experience of university class. Uh, let's say that you're late or you missed, a, you missed a reflection in class because you missed the reflection assignment because, well, you were lazy, you were out late last night partying, and, um, and then you fell asleep in the afternoon or I don't know. Uh, you did something inappropriate. <laughs> it's your fault you weren't there for class, but you tell me. Uh, Dr. Boone, the uh, the MTR wasn't working. That's why I couldn't get here. And you lie to me. What is the justification for your action? Is your justification lying for convenience is okay as long as I'm not hurting anyone? 
If that's the justification for your action, well, <clears throat> imagine a world where everyone does this. Imagine a world in which every student, every time the student has been irresponsible and thinks, oh, I'm not hurting anyone by lying to the teacher, lies and says, I was late because of the MTR, or I couldn't make it to class because of the MTR, or even I couldn't write my research paper on time because I was stuck in the MTR system for two additional hours and didn't have time to write my paper. That's why I need an extra two days to write my paper, when really the student is just uh, procrastinating. Imagine a world in which everyone tells these lies for convenience. Pretty soon, no teacher believes what any student says. No one believes these excuses. And so it doesn't work. Your your principle, if applied universally, would destroy itself. So, since more law is supposed to be universal, now you can review your Kant notes from uh, two weeks ago, I believe. Three weeks ago, I believe. You can review your Kant notes from three weeks ago and, uh, and see my attempts to explain why the categorical imperative version 1 is a good way of testing our actions to see if they're consistent with more law. You test the motivation because the motivation for your action is however you justify it and your justification ought to be consistent with moral law. Moral law is universal, and so it has no exceptions. And so your justification for your action should be something that makes sense if it were applied without exception. So you can't apply lying for convenience is okay if I'm not directly hurting anyone. You can't apply that without exception. Then it would never work. You'd have a chaotic world in which no one could believe anyone. So I think you have to look, though, at the justification for your action very carefully to be sure whether it's okay according to the categorical imperative. People sometimes reduce Kant to saying, oh well, your action should be universalizable and you should always follow the same rules, uh, therefore no lying, no cheating, no stealing, always do this, always do that, always do the other thing. Oh, and, and then they go on to say, and this is what's wrong with Kant, because obviously we have to have exceptions to our rules. Always obey the law. Well, obviously we need an exception to that, because uh, what about when the law is managed by Hitler's government in Nazi Germany? Surely you should break the law if the law says uh, cooperate in handing over Jews to be killed. And people say, well, the consistent rule says never kill anyone, but obviously you have to be willing to kill someone because... Well, otherwise, Nazis would triumph. World War II is another good illustration. And people say Batman's a deontologist because Batman always follows this rule, never kill anyone. And the fact that the Joker keeps escaping from prison and killing more people in various uh, Batman cartoons and video games and some films, perhaps, this illustrates the fact that there's something wrong with Kant. We need to have exceptions to our rules. No, this isn't at all what Kant is doing. As far as I can tell, he's not taking these very general rules based on very general statements. He is talking about general rules, but the general rules can be very specific. I think the categorical imperative is meant to apply to justifications for our actions that are as complex and as uh, responsive to particular circumstances as they need to be. So, if you're just a lazy student and you want to lie to your teacher and say, oh, I couldn't make it because the MTR was shut down, when really the reason you couldn't make it is your own irresponsible behavior. Lying for convenience is okay if I'm not directly hurting anyone is not a good justification for your action. But it does get a bit more complex if the justification for your action is very complex and very responsive to a very unique set of circumstances, which is why I've dared to suggest, as I've gone over in class once or twice, that lying to the murderer at the door might work if it's if the maxim justifying the lie to the murderer at the door is sufficiently responsive to the circumstances that it actually makes sense to apply it universally. I think it might actually work. Now, again, I say this with fear and trembling because I'm trying to play Kant against Kant. I'm daring to think that what Kant thought about this case might have been mistaken, even on terms of his own method. And to be fair to, well, to be fair to me, this is not necessarily something Kant would be all that surprised about. He knows he's fallible. He is talking about the method for knowing what is right. And, of course, it's possible that he would make some mistake in applying the method to particular circumstances. So, if the justification for your action is always lie to murderers at the door, you can't universalize that. If everyone did that, murderers would never believe anyone at the door who said, no, your victim's not here. But if your justification for your action is 
Always lie to murderers at the door when you are living in a world in which some people tell the truth to murderers at the door because they're cowards and they just want to save themselves. If that's the justification for your action, I don't understand why that cannot be universalized. In the hypothetical scenario where everyone starts telling the truth to murderers at the door, then... Sorry, in the hypothetical scenario where everyone does start lying to murderers at the door because they're in a world where everybody or other people tell the truth to murderers at the door, then um, as soon as it stops working because murderers stop believing anyone, well, as soon as it stops working, you're not in that world anymore and you can go back to, uh, let's see, what would you do? You'd go back to... Oh, it gets so complex, um, which is sort of the point. You, the, the categorical imperative version 1 ought to respond to a justification for an action that is as complex in its dealing with particular circumstances as necessary. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an effort to, to go over the details of this one more time. If you want to fast forward for a bit, it probably won't hurt you. Okay, so... If your principle is always lie to murderers at the door to protect the innocent, then in a world in which everyone does this, murderers don't believe anyone, and so it doesn't do any good, and so this is not a universalizable principle. Categorical imperative version 1 uh, rules out that principle. Well, consider the alternative principle when you are living in a world in which some people tell the truth to murderers at the door to save their own skins, then lie to murderers at the door. If everyone followed this principle, then the hypothetical scenario in which everyone lies to murderers at the door never arises because this principle justifying you lying to murderers at the door only works when you're in a world in which some people do tell the truth to murderers at the door. So the, the, the failure of the principle to protect the innocent when the principle is applied universally never arises. Also, maybe this is the more important point, speaking practically, we know what world we're living in. As long as there are murderers at the door, as long as there are murderers at all, there will be people who tell the truth to them to save their own skins. As long as human beings are... As long as there are human beings with moral failures, there will be murderers at the door, and there will be uh, cowards who tell the truth to the murderers to protect their own skins. All right, so... I think the justification for your actions is frequently complex and highly responsive to circumstances. If my brain holds up, I might give you uh, an illustration I rather like, except uh, it might be best to hold off on it in case we get to do our classroom activity in one week. Um, I'm, I'm looking into that. All right, so consider the justification for your action. Consider it carefully. Make it as detailed as you need to. Uh, you're you're not um, justifying your action on some extremely general principle that ignores all circumstances. In fact, here's a great illustration of this. And as often happens, my, my teacup presents a nice, convenient, handy illustration. I want tea. I'm drinking tea. And what is the justification for my action? Is it always drink tea? Well, no, that's a stupid justification. I'm not drinking tea because of because I have the principle always drink tea. I don't even drink tea at night time. Is my principle by which I justify drinking tea always drink tea when you want to? No, because I might want tea at night time. And then if I drink tea at night time, I might not even sleep well. Is the principle always just uh, always drink tea when you can and it's during daytime? No. Some people might do fine drinking tea at night. And also some people don't want to. Am, am I such a jerk that I expect everyone to, to change their ways and drink tea rather than coffee? You know, if they want my advice, I, I do think tea is better, but, but I, I can't say that, um, that that's more than a personal preference. And even if it were, it's not really my business <laughs> whether you're drinking tea or coffee or, or something else or, or nothing. Uh, well, something, but uh, maybe nothing caffeinated. Some people don't even drink caffeine at all. And that's fine, as long as it's legal and healthy. So, is my principle always drink tea when it's legal and healthy and you want it? Almost, because if tea were legal and healthy and you wanted it but you couldn't afford it, uh, maybe you shouldn't drink it. Um, if, if tea was just a little bit too expensive for a tight budget, maybe you shouldn't drink tea. Is the principle... Always drink tea when you want it and it's legal and healthy and you can afford it. 
I think that might be my principle. If you can think of other possible reasons to not drink tea, then uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you'd find that my principle on which I drink tea is is even more specific. But the point is, I'm not applying categorical imperative version one now. I'm not using a principle that can't be universalized. And if you can find some reason I'm not, then probably what you've really found, if you think you can find some reason I'm not, probably what you've really found is a reason to think that I've not articulated my tea drinking principle with enough detail. The principle is not always drink tea, or even always drink tea when you want to, or even always drink tea when you want to and you can afford it. It's a lot of things, and maybe a few I haven't thought of. It's always drink tea when you want it, and you can afford it, and you're pretty sure it's healthy. Want it, afford it, healthy. Uh, oh, and it's legal. You don't have to steal or anything like that. <laughs> there may be some more uh, principles justifying my drinking of tea. And if you're in any doubt, always ask, how do you treat human beings as ends in themselves? Now, all of this was me going into perhaps a little more detail than we needed to on, uh, let's see, where are we in the notes? On when is lying acceptable in more complex Kantian analysis? Again, I don't think Kant approves of lying, but I do think you have to look at a more specific version of the justification for your action, in some cases, to make sure. I may have mentioned this before, but um, my working understanding is that an ethical lie probably does exist, and I may be disagreeing with Kant on that point, but as far as I can understand his method, his method may permit it in a few extreme cases. However, we human beings often want to to have exceptions to the rules. We think the rules hamper our pursuit of happiness. Well, understand that the exception to the rule, do not lie, if there is one, is extremely rare and extremely unpleasant. It's a murder at the door scenario. I have never in my life had the opportunity to tell a lie without sinning, and I, I hope I never do. It's like killing someone without sinning. If, if you can justify it at all in any circumstance, it's extremely rare, and it's a very unpleasant situation. Now, more complex analysis from Mill on the subject of lying coming up. So I think we need to apply Mill's method of understanding what is right with a little more complexity than just do what makes you happy as long as it doesn't look like you're not hurting anyone. Remember, Mill points to the moral inheritance of past experience. This is good empiricism. A scientist does not just abandon inherited scientific theories on the grounds that knowledge comes from experience. Therefore, I question authority. Therefore, I reject authority. Therefore, I uh, reject all established scientific theories. I'm going to begin again to pursue knowledge based on my own experiences. No, that's stupid. You, you presume in favor of the theories that have coalesced from the inheritance of experience. You begin with a presumption in favor of inherited scientific theories. And you test them. Someone ought to be checking on them and, and making sure they still seem uh, they still seem correct. Someone should be looking for errors and maybe finding them, honing the theory, improving it a bit. And in some cases, a scientific theory will need to be rejected, even some of the big ones. Uh, this is a thing. You know, you don't just begin with Newton and stay there. You you need to consider Einstein. You need to consider quantum mechanics. And I'm <laughs> I couldn't even begin to guess what physicists in the future will be considering. But you need to. Um, by all means, correct scientific theory. But you don't just say, well, I'm an empiricist, knowledge comes from experience, so I reject authority. So to heck with Newton, to heck with Einstein, to heck with Hawking, and, and throw away all previous scientific theories. No, you, you assume in favor of the ones that have some, some good evidence from the past. You presume in favor of the ones that are currently dominant, and, and then you move on and maybe correct them if necessary. You do the same thing in ethics. Mill is a moral empiricist. So past moral experience has left us a really rich heritage of of moral principles, of advice, and you can find them in the Bible, you can find them in the Tao Te Ching, you can find them in Confucius and Socrates, you can find them from Aristotle right down to Kant. I think even the categorical imperative, according to Mill's method, can be accepted as a testimony of the moral experience and the moral reflection of the past, and we should start with these. Now, in Mill's methods, all these rules could possibly be an error, and the rules may have exceptions. The only absolute rule is to seek the greatest happiness, understood in terms of quality as well as quantity. Pleasure, remember chapter 2 of utilitarianism, 
the the intellectual pleasures of the human being are of greater value than the physical pleasures of the animal. But anyway, you consider the consequences of rules and not only of actions. So we inherit moral rules from the past, and they may have exceptions, but they lead to a lot of good in the long run. So we have a rule against lying. Now ask yourself, when you're dealing with the question about lying, whether lying in this particular situation will do you so much good that it might outweigh the harm from undermining the rule. If you tell a lie without a good reason, in fact, if you tell a lie at all, you are weakening the rule against lying. That means you should be really careful about lying. It's not a simple case of, I don't see how this hurts anyone directly, therefore lying is okay if it makes me happy. No, 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 the rule against lying increases human happiness. 90 something, 99 point something, 99.99% of the time, probably. So stick with the rule, unless you have really good evidence, this is a good exception. If lying in a particular situation will do you so much good that it could outweigh the harm from undermining the rule, on a utilitarian analysis, borrowing from Mill, I think it could be acceptable to lie. I think the uh, the method here is going to look surprisingly like Kant. You'll find um, very few, if any, exceptions to the rule against lying, but I do think you probably can find exceptions based on the Millian method, and again I say with fear and trembling, uh, perhaps even the Kantian method as well. Let's see if we can move through these notes a little more quickly, and maybe I'll add that other example I've, uh, that came to mind that I like so much. Although, again, I may want to save it so as not to interfere with uh, the moral application exercise I had in mind for the lecture tonight. And Inshallah, maybe we'll try it next week, but I'm looking into that. When is cheating acceptable? The simple Kantian version and the simple uh, utilitarian analysis are, again, Kant says, apply categorical imperative version one. Imagine if everyone cheated when they wanted to. No one would trust anyone, so cheating would never help you, so cheating is always wrong. And utilitarianism, the only rule is happiness, so cheating's not anything that breaks any rule as such. Cheat if it makes you happy as long as you're not hurting anyone. Well, I think this is, again, oversimplifying. The more complex Kantian analysis must zoom in on a more specific justification for your action. Cheating for mere convenience, cheating so you can win at Monopoly, is not justified. If if everyone followed this rule, cheat when it's convenient to win Monopoly, or or whatever, you know, cheat your customers at the store, uh, cheat the store if you're a customer when it's convenient, cheat on your exam, cheat on your research paper assignment, I hope you didn't do that. If everyone does this, no one trusts anyone and cheating doesn't work, so it's not a universalizable principle. But can you imagine a scenario where cheating might work that could be justified on categorical imperative version 1? I think so. So what do I have on my notes? Say the the madman forces me to play chess to save the city. The madman will destroy the city with a nuclear bomb unless I defeat him in chess. And um, if I defeated him in chess, he'll turn himself into the police and tell them where to find the bomb. Um, if I lose in chess, you know, we're all dead. And he's already told me, don't try to cheat. If I catch you cheating, I'll set off the bomb. So what do I have to lose by cheating except what I have to lose by losing? So imagine I'm losing. What good does it do to cheat? Well, it might mean we all get blown up a few seconds earlier, but it also might save the lives of everyone and have the madman surrender himself to the police. Of course I should cheat. So I mean, I think I have a half chance of getting away with it. Um, so Im imagine that this scenario is going on. The madman's forcing me to play chess to save the city, and I know I'm about to lose, but I think I can cheat because he's, you know, he's, he's just started looking over there for some reason. And I think... I think I can cheat without him noticing. My justification for my actions is something like, when you're in these circumstances, cheat in chess to save the city, to save millions of innocent lives. Can you wish that everyone would follow that principle? Yeah, I think you could. <laughs> I don't have a problem with this on categorical imperative version one. And again, if you have any doubt, go with what I think is the usual Kantian principle that's more easy for most of us to apply. Just remember human beings have inherent worth. Every human being has an equal and immeasurable value as a rational being. Treat them accordingly. Treat human beings as ends in themselves. So the, the Millian analysis, again, this should seem familiar if you've been paying attention. The more complex Millian analysis tells us, consider the consequences of the rules we operate by. 
not only the consequences of our individual actions. There's a rule against cheating that we've inherited from the past. It serves happiness. Maybe it has exceptions, but don't undermine the, the rule without a darn good reason. It could lead to a lot of harm in the long run. So if you're thinking about cheating and it's just for your own short-term convenience, don't. You're, you're causing harm by undermining the rule against cheating. Even if no one ever caught you, you are undermining it in yourself. You are going against the virtue that Mill says in chapter 4 is significant. Serve consistently the greater happiness and even have a habit of doing it by the rules, by following the rules, by practicing the customs, the habits that serve the greater happiness. This is good in chapter 4 of utilitarianism. So don't undermine the rule that serves the greater happiness by cheating for mere convenience. But if cheating in a particular situation might do so much good that it outweighs the potential harm from undermining the rule, maybe it's okay to cheat. I've just noticed I had a typo in my notes. It's just been fixed. All right. And then buying pirated movies. The simple analysis from Kant, again, would be categorical imperative version one. Imagine if everyone bought pirated movies when they wanted to. Disney could never afford to make another expensive Avengers movies with cool explosions and special effects. So buying pirated movies would do you no good. So it's always wrong to buy pirated movies. And this simple analysis from utilitarianism is do what makes you happy as long as you're not hurting anyone. So a more complex Kantian analysis would, as I keep saying, apply the categorical imperative version 1 to a more, a more specific maxim or justification for our actions than simply buy pirated movies when it's convenient, unless that's seriously the best you've got. If your, conv if your justification for your action is buy pirated movies because it's easier and it's cheaper and I like money and I want to see the cool movie cheap and I don't think I'm hurting anyone, then Kant cannot approve of that. But, but if you look at a more complex justification in my work, so in, in my last job in Pakistan, it was almost impossible to get legal film at all until Netflix showed up. And it was so cool when Netflix showed up because Netflix narrowed the gap between uh, what was legal and what was right. I wrote about this. Um, I may just give you a URL uh, in the notes on the subject. When, when Netflix went mostly global and showed up in Pakistan and other places where pirated films are a big deal, I thought it was wonderful because it narrowed the gap between, uh, between what was legal and what was um, easy. Uh, I thought that was great. I think that's useful for rule of law, which which makes the world a better place. So um, anyway, before that, <laughs> and when I had to buy my wife a Jane Austen movie for a birthday or for Christmas, I don't remember the details. This happened once or it may have happened twice in Pakistan that I bought her a DVD legally in America, but we weren't going to get the DVD until we traveled to America, which wasn't going to be for two or three months later if it was her birthday or if it was Christmas five, six months later. So I owned the DVD. I just didn't have access locally. And so having paid full price and uh, upheld the rule of law, I went and bought the pirated DVD um, that, was, that was available locally so that my wife could actually watch the, the, the birthday present that I got her or Christmas or whatever it was. So – no, I watched it with her, actually, if, if that's a thing. I have a lot of respect for some Jane Austen films. I've never read the books. This is off topic. So if I can't buy legal DVDs at all, but I bought my wife a Jane Austen movie, and it's on DVD in the USA, but we can't pick it up yet, can I wish that everyone in these circumstances would act on the principle that when you're in these circumstances, buying a pirated movie is okay? I, I have difficulty imagining how a universalization of that justification for my actions is, is so bad. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it wasn't right, according to Categorical Imperative Version 1. But at any rate, it's harder for me to see how there's anything wrong with that. I did intentionally, carefully, assiduously avoid buying pirated films and undermining rule of law under all other circumstances, even when I was in Pakistan. And again, I rejoiced that um, the gap between uh, 
what is easy and what is legal is more narrow now thanks to technology and Netflix and I rejoice at that. Okay, so the more complex mill analysis would again have to look at the rules and in this case uh, not so much rules unless it's the rule follow the law as the rule of law. Rule of law does a lot of good in the world. It, it cuts back on on crime, it makes a stronger economy, it reduces poverty. An increase in rule of law is good for human beings and it's good for human happiness. Now in Mill, of course, happiness is the only real point. The law is not in itself an end in itself. It's not like the law is a categorical imperative in Mill's moral theory, but you have to be careful. Undermining rule of law can lead to a lot of harm in the long run, so don't do it lightly. Ask yourself whether breaking the law in this particular situation will do so much good that it might outweigh the harm from undermining the rule of law. If so, maybe it's okay to break the law if, um, uh, if those are the circumstances. So I guess I will go into another example. This is not in your notes. We, we may... I may have some of you look at this if, if we can work out the details. I have to talk to Dr. Wong. When we oversimplify Kant, we think that Kant says always follow the rules. Always obey the law. So there's a nice law in Hong Kong that says don't cross the street when the little guy is red. You know what I mean? On the, um, on the traffic lights, you have the red guy. The red guy uh, the red guy's just standing still. It means don't cross the street now. Let the cars go. Even if there are no cars, wait your turn. It's not time for pedestrians to cross the street. And then the red guy goes away and the little green guy turns up and the green guy is walking. And now you can cross the street. So like many of you, when I'm walking to campus from Kowloon Tong or something or any other scenario where you're crossing the street, you're walking somewhere in Hong Kong, which happens a lot and your legs are very tired, if you're like me. <laughs> you come to a red light. It's red for pedestrians and you can't cross the street and you're supposed to wait. And sometimes there aren't even any cars. Why are you waiting? So the simplified mill analysis is you're not hurting anyone. Do what makes you happy. Cross the street if you want to. The, complex, uh, the simple Kant analysis is always follow the rules, apply categorical imperative version one. What if everyone crossed the street when the light was red? Before the day was over, someone would be killed by a bus. There are very bad results. This doesn't work out properly. The even the results are not strictly speaking the point. Your desire to have a convenient life by breaking the rules is not a proper desire. The logic of what you're trying to accomplish is shown by such a world, a world in which everyone crosses the street on the red light. It's shown by such a world to be an improper desire. Your motives are corrupt. That's the simple Kant analysis. Well, one time my wife called me because my kid fell at the playground. She fell from a fairly good height, about as tall as I am, standing up. So my kid falls at the playground. She falls from a height about six feet. Um, if you only think in meters, I, I can't help you. <laughs> two meters. Uh, I think two meters is a rough approximation. She falls from about as tall, about as high as I am tall. Maybe a little, I think it's a little higher actually. And she lands on her back, and she lands on um, a, play a platform on the playground. It's about this high off the ground, and it's not as hard as steel, though it probably is steel, because it's got you know that coating they put things they put on steel at playgrounds, so that when you fall, and you're a kid, you don't always have to go to the hospital. But she fell, and she landed on her back on on this this thing with an almost right angle corner that wasn't padded. It was just not as hard as steel. It was, you know, it was pretty hard. Um, it's hard as, uh, harder than a hardcover book by Augustine over there. And she lands on her back. And when, when you fall from that height and you land on your back on this right angle thing, your, your back is injured. And I would have assumed her back was broken. My wife would have assumed her back was broken. My wife keeps her wits about her and doesn't doesn't totally freak out and lose her ability to deal with the crisis. She finds out the kid can walk, the kid looks okay, but seriously, she fell from six feet and landed with her back on a right angle, hard thing. She needed to go to the hospital. This is a family emergency. So my wife calls me about this and we have 
too many kids at home to keep um, a maid in the home, so we, we keep one of our kids in the maid's room. And so we didn't have anyone convenient to leave the kids with. My wife needs to take the injured child to the emergency room. So my wife needs to take the kid to the MT. My wife needs to take the kid to the ER, to the emergency room. And I have to come home to watch the other kids. I'm in the office. So I run to Kowloon Tong Station to get home quickly. Now, do you think I stopped and waited for the traffic light to turn red? If there was a red light at an intersection when I was ready to cross and there were no vehicles coming? Do you think I should have waited when I have a kid in shots in who needs to get to the hospital immediately? Do you think the justification for my actions, which specifically included the family emergency, do you think the justification for my action could be universalized according to categorical imperative version one? You, you think through it and, and get your own answer. You should be able to get um, the answer at this point. Um, at any rate, it's not nearly the, uh, the simple Kantian... Um, the oversimplified version of Kantianism we sometimes get. Always follow the rules, always follow the rules. Now, it's um, always follow moral law and always make sure the justifications for your action can be universalized according to categorical imperative version 1 and always treat human beings as ends in themselves. But when all I have is the boredom and the inconvenience of waiting for the light to turn red, I wait every time. I wait to uphold the rule of law I wait because Kant tells me to, and I wait because I think Mill also tells me to. So what lessons do we learn from all this? Well, moral perspectives are often oversimplified in ways which may help us easily keep track of some of the main ideas, but I think can also be very misleading. Like when people say, Kant says you should never treat people as a means to an end, or deontology means you should always follow the rules. Utilitarianism means nothing at all except the results matters. And Aristotle says, always choose the middle way, balance everything. And Confucius is all about submitting to authority and adhering to tradition. And none of these things are quite right. In fact, Kant says, never treat people as merely a means to an end. I don't think he's the kind of stupid that would tell you to starve to death because you could never buy food from anyone because you'd be using that person as a means to the end of getting food. Kant says, treat them as an ends in themselves. Treat them as ends of themselves, even when you use them as a means to an end. Deontology means you should always follow moral law. You always follow your obligations. But the rules, well, it depends on what the rules are. There may be some rules that have exceptions. I think Kant understands this. Utilitarianism does not say only the results matter. In a certain sense, yes, only the results affect the, the, um, the morality of an action. But Mill, even in the very same sentence when he says this, also will say the intention matters. It affects the character of the person. It matters to the morality of you, even if it does not affect the morality of the action. And the morality of you well, that involves character, that involves virtue, that involves habits. Chapter 4 of Utilitarianism points towards some kind of a virtue ethics theory that utilitarianism recognizes the importance of. And if you study enough Kant, you'll find he also talks about virtue. Confucius, well, there is an emphasis on submitting to authority and adhering to tradition. But then we also have Mencius, Master Meng, Meng Tzu, critiquing kings boldly in ways that you would expect would get him killed. You'd expect him to have his head cut off the way he speaks to kings. He just does it with such marvelous rhetoric that he, he doesn't get killed. I'm very impressed by Meng's rhetoric in talking to monarchs. Um, Meng, Master Meng, saying that um, he's heard of this scenario, uh, this historical case, where some people killed a guy who was in charge, who fancied himself king, but he didn't hear of people who murdered a king, because this guy was not a legitimate king, because he was corrupt. Authority is not always legitimate authority if it doesn't practice ren, if it doesn't practice virtue. The ruler has to care for the people to be a legitimate ruler. And then you have this passage in the Analects, and you can track this down for yourself if you want to, and by all means consult the original languages uh, in LSE 1710. Most or all of you can do that. Um, this is the like translation, I think, where he says, a son may remonstrate with his parents. Well, <laughs> If you can remonstrate with your parents, you can criticize your parents. That's what it means. Um, you're not only submitting to authority blindly. There's some kind of critical thinking and critique of authority that comes with Confucianism. There's this line, frequent remonstrances with the prince 
cause some trouble. There's the uh, assumption behind that that a good Confucian advisor is going to correct the prince. The, the government is subject to correction by the philosophical advisor in Confucianism. There's Confucius' reevaluation of the cloth used in a capping ceremony. The traditional cap was made of, I hope I don't get silk and linen backwards, I think the traditional one was made of linen, but silk was better for the people because it was cheaper. Confucius cares about people, so he said, I like this innovation in the ritual. Not every ritual should be followed blindly in all particulars. So in Kant, the universal principles are not all the rules, like obey the law of your country and do not cheat. The universal principles are the moral law and follow the categorical imperative and also any justification for an action, any maxim, in his word, that makes it through category comparative version 1 or 3, that makes it through that test, that passes that test, any such a principle, yeah, that's a, a rule you should always follow. But sometimes you have to make pretty detailed justifications for your maxims, uh, justifications for your actions. Sometimes those maxims are very specific. And I think Kant knows well enough that there are complications in moral decision-making. There are exceptions to some rules. In Mill's utilitarianism, I think we actually have, using a Kantian term, moral law. You are always supposed to act so as to bring about the greatest possible happiness. There is no exception. Good rules like do not lie, do not steal, and obey the law of your country do lead to greater happiness in the long run, at least most of the time. But they can have exceptions, and there's a presumption in their favor and you can do what's right most of the time by following them, but there may be some exceptions. And I think Mill and Kant, in short, do not disagree half as often as, as we may have been told sometimes. And more generally now, the study of ethics. And if you're looking at the notes on, on the Google Doc linked for Moodle, um, I'm very near the end now. The study of ethics often gives us very clear, straightforward answers pertaining to everyday life. Most of the rules we have to consider do have exceptions, but they're still good rules and they're worth upholding them. They're worth being upheld. But don't break them for trivial reasons. Do uphold them. Do not break them for trivial reasons. But many rules might need to be broken on occasion. Like the traffic light rule might, might under some circumstances, be appropriate to break. Cross the street when the pedestrian light is red and you're a pedestrian. When you have a family emergency to literally run home to. Perhaps. I think that is a very good exception to that rule. And here's some good advice for you. C.S. Lewis said, if, all we, if we did all that Plato or Aristotle or Confucius told us, we should get on a great deal better than we do. Now, in context, he's talking about Jesus. And he says, Jesus is not a moral teacher. That's not the point. He's right. That's not the point of Christian theology or Christian ethics or Jesus or the Bible. And the point is something different. Lewis goes on to explain that uh, if that was the point, well, why bother with Jesus? We should just start with the more rudimentary lessons in Aristotle or Confucius. But... Um, going towards ethics instead of theology, I think it's useful to know at least some strategies for knowing right from wrong, more than one. I think it's helpful to know some moral theories from Confucius, Augustine, Aristotle, Kant, Mill, and I think it's good to have a few big summary principles like the golden rule. I think it's good to uh, apply them always. I think you'll be right most of the time. And I think ethics is not nearly as complicated as most people think. I think if you don't know what to do, at least stick with the golden rule. Try to practice habits of doing good and keep some of the virtues in Confucius or Aristotle in mind. And categorical imperative version 1, I think, is... No, sorry, version 2 is fairly easy to understand for most of us most of the time and fairly applicable. Treat human beings as ends of themselves. This is my advice, but more generally rewinding and repeating myself, I think it's good to know some strategies for knowing right from wrong from more than one major moral theory and um, apply them even if there's some mistake in Kant, apply Kant always and you will do what's right most of the time. And I think it helps to apply um, to know more than one moral theory just to be safe. All right, I hope to see some of you in a week. I may show up. I'm planning to show up if we get a lecture in a week uh, for the first hour. Hopefully I'll see you then.